Thanks, Corey. All right. Well, what an interesting transition we are making right now. Uh, it's going to be great. So we've heard a lot so far this week, um, and it's been really cool the way We've had just bits and pieces layered in through each time. So our mornings, our evenings, hearing from each person. I've loved getting a different perspective. Um, this theme, I think, is an awesome one, uh, broken becoming. Uh, we've been talking a lot about brokenness this week. Uh, some of you even wore it on your shirts tonight. Fantastic. Uh, now, when I think of brokenness, it's an interesting one. You might be like me sometimes, where you're like, well, am I really broken? Uh, I don't like the way that sounds. Uh, maybe you're even not sure why we keep talking about it. Maybe you're not sure you want to be broken. It sounds painful, right? Uh, and let's be clear, brokenness, I'm not talking about that thing that started to get popular now. Uh, especially on social media, but everywhere, it's this kind of super curated version of brokenness. Uh, think of trends like hashtag woke up like this, uh, or anyone showing almost anything on Instagram where they're subtly complaining about it, but they're actually, actually just showing off how great whatever that thing is. Uh, this is a very stylized version of a very limited kind of brokenness, and it's usually not the kind of brokenness that that person actually struggles with. They show a little bit of one that's appropriate, uh, that, that doesn't cut too deep. Oh my gosh, look how messy my bed is after I just slept in it. Wow. Right? We do stuff like that. Or we say, oh my gosh, when I flop my hair like this, doesn't that just look so ridiculous? Uh, and we're really saying, don't you think I look great? All right, so I think you guys know about that. Uh, we're not talking about that. Um, that's not real brokenness, right? Uh, that's just another version of having it all together in a super curated presentation of what you think you're supposed to be. And it's tough right now because everyone from like old people down to like eight year olds are just pumped so much with this idea of the way you need to be and perfection. Or the image you're supposed to be of being just enough imperfect, but it's still this like super stylized thing. All right. Uh, so that's not what we're talking about. Uh, what are we talking about? Are you really broken? Am I really broken? Are all of us who keep talking at you just like making a big deal about something that's, you know, not that big a deal? All right, well, let's see. Um, are there any times where you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't fall back to sleep because you're anxious about something? Or do you ever have a feeling like it's just this weight sitting on your chest and it's hard to get words out. It's hard to move sometimes, but you don't know why. Or is it just in a flash, you just get so angry and you don't know where it came from? Or is it you just start crying and keep crying and it's uncontrollable? Or when you're at school or in a group, that nervousness comes over you and the more you think about it, the harder it is to say anything or open your mouth or look at anyone or be seen. Or the sadness from something that happened to you that you know wasn't right and it still hurts. All of these, that's brokenness. And it hits us all. It's the feeling something is not quite right. It's not the way you've heard it should be. It's not the way you dream it 
could be. So when I was your age, middle school, high school, um, I worked so hard to get everything right and to not ever get in trouble or have anyone be mad at me or disappointed in me. My goal was to do everything perfectly every single time. Uh, super fun. Uh, but in that, I knew that if I just worked myself harder, I could approach that. But then what I was really lacking was connection to the people around me. And that's what I longed for. I wanted to be connected. I wanted to be a part of something. Uh, you know, the kids at school that I went to would always call me perfect. Uh, they would say, oh, well, he never makes mistakes. Uh, but when they said it, it wasn't a compliment, right? Uh, it just created more distance. And I didn't know what to do about that. Uh, everyone always assumed, oh, well, you must have spent all weekend just studying, right? Um, I didn't. I spent a lot of my Friday nights wishing that I had a group, wishing that I had somewhere to belong, wishing that I could have connection. Uh, and so at times, I would get really frustrated. Uh, I had an interesting room growing up with, uh, so I had a bedroom that was on the top floor, so it had like a slanted roof on both sides. And there was this little closet door that wasn't a real door because it had the slant in it. So it was this like, I don't know, fiberboard door. And this poor door was right next to my desk. Uh, so it's like fiberboard. So I'd sit at my desk, and at some point, I'd just be so frustrated that as much effort as I was putting in to like doing the things that I thought I control, could control, and being perfect, and doing every assignment, and checking it over twice, and reading every single word I was assigned in middle school and high school, uh, in every assignment that I got in every class. And then sometimes it would just get so frustrating, and I would like hit the door next to me, and like punch it again. And this isn't solid wood, but this is like this fiberboard door. So at times, it was just like, hit the door. And <laughs> the door would start to break. Uh, it started to splinter a little bit. Uh, and this you know, went on for a while. By the end of high school, man, this poor door uh, was like completely destroyed. Uh, so like, there was a big hole through the middle and a bunch of other little holes. Uh, <laughs> and I had to be like, sorry, mom and dad, the door broke. Uh, <laughs> all right, so that was just one example. And I say that just because it's different for everyone. And especially hard is that we're trained to like judge other people by what we can see on the surface. Like just being a kid these days like sort of does that to you. Oh, you're this. Oh, you're that. Oh, you're this kind. Oh, you're that kind. We all get sucked into it. Um, and so... This is just my example, but you know, you may have thought, oh, well, he gets great grades, he does all the activities at school, he's doing great. But then for me in it, I was just lost and confused and frustrated, and it was broken. So I use that example for me, and I know it's different for each one of you. Um, but we all struggle with it. Why do we hate talking about it so much? If you're like me, you don't like it, especially coming from what I just said. Broken is a problem. It means there was something that's not the way it's supposed to, that it's not perfect, right? Uh, we like to think we're perfect, and then we get so angry because I think deep down inside, I was trying so hard because I knew I wasn't perfect. Uh, and you know, there's something, because we know, there's something in me also, it's just not right, it's just broken. Uh, we know that. So when we hear things that we know are just surface platitudes, you're perfect just the way you are. Uh, it feels like hollow, right? Someone else just saying those words doesn't actually change what's going on. Uh, if that were true, why would I still feel this way, right? If I'm perfect just the way I am. Saying it doesn't make it true, right? All right, and then 
We don't like it. So some people, you may have heard people respond in a way where they sort of say, oh, well, I'm just a mess. And that's sort of what they put forward all the time. But they're not saying it in a humble way or like they're asking for help. Or maybe they say, hey, that's just my sense of humor. I have a mean sense of humor. That's just the way I am. Or they might say, well, I'm just a perfectionist. This is the way I do things. So you better get with it. Or, well, I'm just not a patient person. Uh, right? It's when people say things like that, it's not acknowledging it really. It's creating an excuse, but really what it is is trying to create permission, right? So that once you say that, well, this is just the way I am, uh, that maybe it means no one can call you out on it, right? Because you've said, oh, no, no, this is just the way I am. Uh, or no one can shout you out for it. Uh, if you're Anna. Um, no, no one can call you out on it because I've already said, no, no, no. Yeah, it's just the way I am. All right, so maybe you respond in that way. Uh, the problem is we know we're broken. We don't like it. Some of us just keep denying it, right? Some of us do that thing where we try to make excuses. Uh, and then a lot of us just try to numb it. The specifics are different for each of us. But I would say the process is the same. So maybe it's you numb the things by buying stuff and spending money and getting the next cool thing. Um, maybe you numb the stuff by eating food or by not eating food or finding some other way to medicate yourself or some other way to soothe yourself. Uh, we call this kind of stuff consolation. Uh, Maybe it's watching another show or scrolling through another page of people you don't know on social media. Uh, it's not really what we need, but it's something that we think will make us feel that brokenness a little bit less for a little while. Maybe it'll distract us for a little while. Uh, so when we don't want to face our brokenness, sometimes we turn to these consolations. And it's different for each of us, but it's this thing that just numbs us. OK, the problem with numbing is you can't selectively numb. You can't just numb the bad stuff and keep the good stuff. Uh, if you numb, you numb everything. And if you keep numbing, it just increases it. So you might numb your pain a little bit. You might numb your sadness a little bit. You might numb your anger a little bit. But then you're also known numbing love and joy and gratitude and happiness and connection. Uh, and after we numb for a while, man, we're still miserable because nothing's changed. The thing that was making us feel broken in the first place uh, hasn't changed. So then we try to numb it again. We try to unrun it, outrun it again. We think, okay, no, 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 maybe just another show. Okay, maybe just a few more minutes of this. Maybe if I just go with those people again. It's a cycle. Uh, Think of the roller coaster we started out with on Monday, um, like the one we did together, but like a real roller coaster. There's parts where you're soaring and it feels like you're flying, right? And then there's parts where you feel like your stomach's in the pit, in the in your throat, and you want to throw up, and you hope it's over. Uh, but you can't get the speed and the sense of flying without the big drops that help you get there. Uh, if you numb a roller coaster, you get a straight line. No highs, no lows. Uh, probably not worth waiting in line for as a ride. And definitely not worth living as a life. If you want a great life, you can't keep numbing yourself. And uh, this is a little bit of where I am right now. So again, I think all of us who are speaking up here are coming from a place of 
okay, this is what the Lord is dealing with me about right now. And we share it as a way to encourage all of us together, including me. Um, so a couple of years ago, uh, there was a really tough moment in my life. It was a couple of years after college. Uh, my whole world sort of like exploded, fell apart. I didn't know what I was doing. It was painful. It hurt. I was angry. I thought I had done everything to have that perfect like, like I was talking about in high school. Always follow the rules. Never have anyone mad at you. Never have anyone question you, right? And despite all of that, everything exploded. Uh, I didn't know how to fix it. And there was a little while, I spent a lot of time numbing myself. I would just think, OK, if I can just do the thing that I want to do, this idea I have, whatever it was, um, you know, eating my favorite thing, and then watching the show that I want to watch, and then watching another one. I you know, sit down on the couch, turn on the TV, pass an hour, two hours, eight hours, pass a day, pass a week. Uh, but the thing is, every time I turned off the TV, nothing had changed. And then there's something weird about the way the brokenness is wired is we wake up another day and we think, oh, no, what I really want is just to do this, right? Oh, that's what's going to make me happy. If I just do it this way, I'm going to do it again. It's numb. But then when you come out, nothing's changed. <laughs> nothing's changed. The problem is the solutions we come up with to our own brokenness don't actually work because we can't see the whole picture. We don't have all the information. Uh, and honestly, this is one that I still struggle with sometimes. Uh, there are days uh, where life has gotten complicated. We have a baby, Lucia, who's wonderful, who a lot of you guys have met, uh, and she's great. And Christine and I uh, have Lucia in our lives, and we're very happy. Uh, but it's a totally different life. Uh, and sometimes I find myself thinking, uh, if I could just get a day without any responsibilities to do what I want to do, to just eat my favorite things and to watch my favorite show or my soccer game, then I'll be happy. Uh, so I still have those moments where I think, oh, I know the answers to what I need. I haven't totally learned this one. God's done some things for me, which we'll talk about. But like, I say this as I'm still in the middle of it. Um, so what do we do? All right, we're learning this week that is broken and becoming people, broken people who want to become something. We're in good company. The Bible's filled with stories about people who are broken and becoming. We've heard about people like Moses killed someone. God said, I'm going to use you. We've heard about people like Elijah running for his life. God said, I'm going to show you my face. We've heard about people like uh, Wade you know, you read the Bible, uh, and you come up with pronunciations in your head. And my pronunciation was always Mephibosheth with the emphasis differently. I'm starting to realize now that that probably sounds weird. Uh, have you guys ever done that with words you've only ever read? Uh, Mephibosheth. Uh, or as Wade would say, Mephibosheth. Um, a guy who was crippled physically broken, and then he got to eat at the king's table. Um, we heard about a uh, story uh, throughout the Bible. Uh, I'll talk about a couple quick ones and then one a little bit longer one. So there's a couple of verses in here, just to give us context. So Old Testament, we've got David, one of my favorite characters. So the Old Testament is like the part of the Bible that's older, before Jesus came around. You see what they did in the name there? That's good. Uh, older. Uh, comes before the New Testament. Hey. Uh, no, so the Old Testament. Uh, David was king in Israel. He wrote most of the Psalms. Just a quick note, if you're not sure what to do during quiet times, I encourage you to try spending some time in the Psalms. Basically, it's a recording of this guy David's quiet time conversations with God. So if you don't know what to do, Read some Psalms. Uh, you might notice that it's just a guy saying what's going on to God. And that helps me think, oh, I can do that. Uh, all right, but David, he's broken, right? In Psalm 51, 1 through 3. So that's like the big, long book. There's 150 Psalms. 
It's in the Old Testament, Psalm 51, 1 through 3. Uh, David, this guy who's king, a man after God's own heart, he says, have mercy on me, O God, for I know my transgressions. My sin is always before me. You could say my brokenness is always before me. He was struggling with the same thing we're talking about tonight. Then at another point, though, same guy, uh, Psalm 37, 4 through 6. Again, you can write these down. You can look at them later. This one's Psalm 37, 4 through 6. Same guy says, delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. That's a cool one. God will make your righteousness shine, even though your sin was always before you. Okay. Uh, Another example that I like that's in the Bible of someone who's broken and becoming uh, is a guy who wrote most of the New Testament named Paul. All of the letters, almost all the letters that come after the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were written by Paul, except for a couple. So again, guy who we would think, this is a great guy. Uh, In Romans, he says, uh, sorry, I'll give you the section so you can write it down. This is Romans 7. It's a long passage. I'm just going to pick out uh, one part, but I'll give you the whole passage. 7, 14 through 24. Romans 7, 14 through 24. Uh, Paul is broken. He says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And for me, I can say, I don't know why I think that sitting down and getting my favorite ice cream or whatever it is and watching another episode of whatever it was that this time, uh, no, 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 this will be great. I keep doing the thing that I don't want to do that I know doesn't help me. I hate it. So Paul then later in the next verse, he says, who will rescue me from this body of death? And then he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. The story... um, that I think does a great job that we'll spend just a little bit in talking about this broken and becoming is in Luke 15. So these verses, Luke 15, 11 through 24. This is the story, sometimes it's called the prodigal son, sometimes it's called the lost son. All right. So you can write the verses, Luke 15, 11 through 24. So in this story, there's a kid. He's in a family. He goes to his dad, uh, and he says, I want my inheritance now. Interesting. When do you normally get your inheritance? Like when someone dies, they write a will, and they leave their inheritance to people. So weird thing to go to your dad and say, I want my inheritance now. Uh, It's not quite saying, I wish you were dead, but it's a little bit like, I'm done with you. I want the things you can give me, but relationship, family, I'm done with you. Uh, So he does that, and the father actually goes along with it, and he gives him his share. Uh, And there was some kind of brokenness he was dealing with. And he decided, if I can just do my favorite things, everything is going to be great. So he took his bag of money and went and did what he thought would be his favorite things. Uh, As you can imagine, he ran out pretty fast. And then famine came. And his favorite things weren't doing anything to solve the brokenness and the hunger that he was facing. All right. So there's this great moment. It says, when he came to his senses. And I think this is an interesting one because he doesn't necessarily like have that 
transformation moment where the heavens open and he sees the light. He's still scheming a little bit. He says, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. So the guys who work for my dad, they are all taken care of. He has a big estate, even though there's famine. He's like planned ahead. So even servants there are taken care of. So what if I go back? This is what I'm going to do. All right, let's see. Uh, Dad, I'm so sorry. No, that's uh, hmm. no, more respect. OK. Father. Yeah, OK, father. Father. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, hmm. OK. Oh, I've heard this one. OK, father. <clears throat> father, I have sinned against you. Oh, wait, no, 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 okay, okay. It's not just, no, this will be good. All right, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Uh, can I come just work in your house for my witch? Oh, no, no, okay. I'm no longer worthy to be your son. Can you make me like one of your hired men? I'm no longer, I'm no, I'm no longer worthy. So he's walking back to his father's house and he's rehearsing. He's like, all right, this is going to work. Uh, all right, but then this is the moment where change happens. The son is still a schemer. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. How did his father see him? He wasn't inside. He was outside, and he was looking. His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. All right, so this is a big moment. And then the son, though, is a little like, OK, no. Father, I have sinned. And he can't even get the words out. His father brushes him off. He's not even listening. He turns to his servants and says, quick, bring the best clothes. Give it to him. Give him the family ring for his finger. Give him shoes for his feet. Bring out the fattened calf, the best food we have, and kill it. There's still a famine going on. Bring out the best food we have. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost, and he is found. That's the moment where things changed. And it wasn't because of anything the son had done. He was still a schemer. And he was too busy rehearse, saying his rehearsed speech to realize what his father was offering him. He was dead, and his father was offering him new life. Uh, all right, so in this story, uh, this is the bridge between broken and becoming. And it's a little different because uh, it's not something that we can get better at. It's not just if you try a little bit harder at becoming, you'll get there. If you just like try a little harder, You'll get, no, it's not that. The son is still a mess. He's still manipulative. And the father runs out to him. Jesus is the bridge, not because he helps us do a little better than we could without him. 
Uh, but because he comes and takes the place of brokenness instead of us. It's not just by positive thinking or pretending I'm not broken or ignoring our brokenness or numbing our brokenness or making excuses for it. This is just the way I am. Uh, with Jesus, he takes our brokenness for him and instead gives us his life. Okay, it's a tricky thing. Uh, we're not enough in ourselves, but because of him, all of a sudden we are enough. God comes and tells us we are perfect, not because we are perfect in ourselves, but because when he looks at us, he sees Jesus, who is the perfect one. When that father looks as his son, he sees him raised to new life. Uh, there's a writer that I like, uh, and he has a book, and he's got this great line. Uh, he says, what we have, therefore, in faith is a top-to-bottom conspiracy to obstruct justice if we're looking for, like, guilt in a courtroom. Not only can the district attorney not find the evidence against us anymore, he's so in cahoots with the judge with their plan to declare not guilty that he's not even seriously interested in looking for evidence anymore. Uh, if God is judge, if Jesus is the one who is acting as the district attorney in that metaphor, uh, they're working together uh, because it's already been taken care of. God is not vindictive, uh, which means seeking vengeance for us who are broken. He is vindicative. To vindicate someone is to make it restored to fullness, completely dealt with. He's not vindictive when he sees us. He's vindicative. Uh, the father who sees the son is... Man, he could have said so many things to the son who had said, I wish you were dead, I'm done with you, and then made a bunch of mistakes that the father knew were going to happen. He doesn't. He's completely vindicated. Uh, so we're broken, we're becoming, it's both at the same time. Uh, and the thing is, it's not that we're patched up like used goods. Like, okay, you're like this dirty uh, whatever cup Corey had the other day, and we'll put you on the shelf with the new cups and we'll say, yeah, you're fine. Uh, and everybody actually knows, no, that's like a gross, dirty cup. Uh, it's not that at all. It's not just pretending. It's like Christine said the first night, God takes the broken things and he sacrifices himself. Jesus comes and he takes our brokenness and he suffers the consequence of it and then he fills the cracks in our lives with pure gold. He turns it into something new that's even better than it could have been before. All right, this is a good one because we don't go back to an earlier version before we screwed things up. It's this whole new world where we become something totally new that's totally been screwed up and then filled with pure gold to become something totally new. Uh, so this is what's on offer to us, I believe. Um, if you're in between broken and becoming, for some of us, we may have heard it, and we may be, okay, I can see the brokenness, so what do I do? All right, well, Jesus is here. He's the bridge, but he's the one who makes the way to take our brokenness upon him and actually deal with it so that we can be raised to something new. Uh, and he wants to know each of us. He wants to know you. You have a chance tonight and this week, if you don't, to know him uh, in the same way 
where you can imagine that son walking up to his father. You don't have to get it all perfect. You may still be like, okay, like maybe I'll approach God this way and I'll only tell him these things. Like if you come to him, he runs to you and he throws his arms around you. And he says, let's celebrate what was lost is found. What was dead is alive. I think that's the thing. So if you're struggling with your brokenness, he's the answer and he's here. And he wants to take from you your brokenness. We have to be willing to let go of it and believe that it won't lead to us getting mocked and made fun of for all the mistakes. No, that it will lead to us then being whiter than the whitest snow. So we're going to turn, uh, Corey will come back. We'll turn to a time of worship and response. Um, and I want to encourage you, um, if you're looking for, okay, how do we get there? Ask Jesus if it's really true that he can take it. And believe that he can do something for us tonight, that he can do something for me that's not just numbing. So, Corey, you can come on back.